Good evening, everybody. This is Carl Wood, and uh, we're going to be talking tonight about Frederick Engels' uh, short book, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. Uh, this is one of, it's considered to be one of the real classics of Marxism. Uh, this is the book as it's uh, in its version that was published by international publishers. It includes uh, about 45 pages of the actual text of the book, plus a long introduction, which is well worth reading, uh, as well as an afterword uh, that people may find interesting as well. Socialism is not an idea that originated with Marx and Engels. Throughout history, people have reacted to oppression and economic inequality with ideas of a cooperative and egalitarian society, uh, such as uh, a lot of the uh, beliefs and practices of early Christianity. Uh, there were socialist ideas that showed up in some of the writings of uh, some of the early Greek philosophers. And by the end of the feudal period, and uh, in the 16th century Germany, the uh, peasant uprisings in Central Europe embraced some ideas that we recognize as socialistic today. As capitalism developed through the 1700s, European philosophers such as Morelli and Mably invented schemes for communistic organization of society. They were not themselves representative of the working class, or nor did they come out of the working class. But it was beginning to be evident, even at that time, the terrible inequities that the new emerging system of capitalism was bringing on. In response to the terrible social disruption of emerging capitalism in the early 1800s, three great European thinkers, Henri Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, and Robert Owen, developed elaborate plans for egalitarian socialist societies. But because they did not identify the social forces that could bring these societies into existence, we refer to them as utopian socialists. They believed that what was necessary to bring about a better society was simply to convince people of the need for it. Uh, they did not identify social forces that would bring this new society into existence. With the revolutions of 1848 in Germany, France, and other countries, it became apparent that the working class was now a major force for social change. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels in the Communist Manifesto and other works declared that class was, uh, the working class, was because of its role in capitalist economy capable of, in fact, compelled to replace the exploitation and anarchy of capitalism with a new socialist society. With this, socialism was pay, placed on a real basis, and thus they, and today we, refer to it as scientific, because it's not merely an invention of the mind, but it's a transformation of society which is based on real social forces. Socialism, utopian and scientific, is a very brief, readable explanation of the essential ideas of Marxist concept of socialism. Chapter 1 presents a sympathetic description of the contributions of the key utopian socialists, along with critiques of their shortcomings. Chapter 2 is a brief and very clear explanation of Marx's philosophy, materialism. Chapter 3 explains capitalist exploitation and explains how, quote, the stubborn facts of the existing system of production, end quote, not a utopian wish list, will drive social change. In the introduction, Engels describes his and Marx's, quote, view that this, the course of history, which seeks the ultimate cause and the great moving power of all important historical events in the economic development of society, in the changes in the mo modes of production and exchange, and in the consequent division of society into distinct classes, and in the struggles of these classes against one another. A revolution, as Marxists understand the term, is a change in power from one class to another. A question that has always occupied revolutionary socialists is, how will the revolution take place? 
The utopians believed that it would happen by moral and intellectual persuasion. The capitalists could be persuaded that it was in their own self-interest to have a fairer, more rational society. By the time Engels wrote this book, it was clear that wasn't going to happen. Since Engels' death, there has developed a view among some that the revolution would be a single event, a seizure of power by the working class party, as in Russia in 1917 or Cuba in 1960. In his introduction to this book, Engels describes the protracted period of the overthrow of feudalism in a succession of revolutionary events. He describes how the bourgeoisie took power through a series of revolutions, the Protestant Revolution in Germany, in which local princes triumphed over the central power of kings and the Pope, the Calvinist Republican victories in Holland, England, and Scotland, and the political revolutions in France in 18, 1793 and in Germany in 1848. In France, revolution took several phases to consolidate the new bourgeois republic. The Great Revolution of 1793 and subsequent revolutions of 1830 and 1848 to 51, in all of which the working class took important, sometimes leading roles, but was not in a position to take power in its own name. Rather, the beneficiaries were principally the new emerging bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. In England, quote, the Industrial Revolution completely shifted the center of gravity of economic power, end quote. That is from the aristocracy to the bourgeoisie. Our own bourgeois revolution occurred in several stages. Uh, we all know about the Revolutionary War that started in 1776 and was uh, consolidated with the Constitution uh, in 1789. Uh, but this Revolutionary War, as, uh, as, as profound and radical as it was, did not complete the bourgeois revolution. Uh, the major piece of work that was left undone was the uh, elimination of chattel slavery of African-American people who were brought to our shores in chains. Uh, this contradiction, uh, this unfinished business of capitalism, festered on until it finally came to a head in 1860 uh, with the Civil War, uh, a bloody conflict that lasted for five years from 1860 to 1865 and resulted in a revolutionary transfer uh, of enormous amounts of uh, what was referred to at the time was property, but in fact it was human beings who uh, had a value of millions and millions of dollars. Uh, the, uh, the freeing of the slaves without compensation to their owners was a revolutionary act. Uh, but it was one that wasn't completed uh, in itself. The freeing of the chattel slaves was partly completed, but it was, and it was uh, written into the Constitution in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. But the overthrown slave owners, the slaveocracy, uh, fought back, launched a counter-revolution uh, with the destruction of uh, radical reconstruction, and through the end of the 19th century established a new legal order, uh, mainly in the South, which reestablished many of the discriminatory practices uh, that existed under slavery. Uh, we refer to that generally as Jim Crow, but uh, there were laws that were written referred to as the Black Codes, which deprived African-American peoples of uh, rights that were guaranteed to them in these post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution. That revolution, the Civil War, uh, still needed to be completed, and uh, the actions of people, especially the African-American people in the United States in the 20th century, culminating in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and continuing to this day, in my view, constitute uh, an additional phase of the bourgeois revolution.
they are truly a revolutionary movement, uh, even though they don't directly involve overthrowing the government of the United States, but they have revolutionary implications. Understanding Engels' analysis is a powerful refutation of both the reformist view that socialism can only be achieved through small incremental reforms and the ultra leftist view that revolutionary changes that fall short of complete overthrow of the capitalist systems are futile and a waste of time. We don't talk too much today about utopian socialism. And to understand why that's the case, it's worthwhile looking back at uh, the socialist movement as it existed during Engels' time in the late 1800s. Marxism had become uh, a major, in many cases, a dominant current in the new, newly emerging socialist workers' parties in Europe, uh, in Germany in the first place. But it wasn't uh, the only viewpoint that existed. Uh, there were other viewpoints um, that represented, to some extent, uh, lingering uh, attitudes supporting anarchism uh, and what is called syndicalism, which is a belief that society should be ruled by workers organized into unions, into uh, trade unions in their workplaces. The influence of the great utopian socialists uh, continued to linger into, uh, certainly into the 1870s when Engels wrote his book. And, uh, but not long after that, uh, Marxism achieved a primary, a uh, position of uh, primary influence throughout the workers' movement. And utopianism became a minor stream that in a lot of ways has been forgotten today. What began to take its place as a challenge to revolutionary Marxism, to revolutionary socialism, was various forms of reformism. Uh, the most important one that emerged towards the end of the 19th century is referred to as economism. That is the belief that socialism would be brought about not as a revolutionary struggle, but through workers fighting for economic gains, better wages, hours, and working conditions, mainly. Uh, this emerged into uh, a modified form that later became uh, known as revisionism. It revised Marxism to take away the revolutionary essence of it and turn it into a reformist trend. The uh, revisionism was embraced by many people who called themselves socialist, and in fact, uh, important leaders of the socialist movement, uh, many of whom had been Marxist up until that time. And uh, by the uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, two trends had begun to emerge. One was revolutionary Marxism. The other was uh, social democratic uh, approaches to socialism, uh, which are generally referred to as social democracy. With the uh, coming of World War I, there was, uh, with all the other changes and tragedies that were brought about by that uh, cataclysm that killed millions and millions of people. There was also a split in the uh, world socialist movement, uh, especially in Europe, but in other countries as well. And it was a split between the reformists and the radicals. Um, the radical position was consolidated after the success of the revolution in Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin. And uh, the radical uh, revolutionary socialists became known as communists. The uh, reformists were generally known as socialists or social democrats. Uh, virtually every socialist party experienced a split between these two viewpoints and these two factions. And uh, in many respects, that division in the world socialist movement uh, continues to this day. 
I'm not going to go into a great deal of uh, discussion or really much of any more discussion about utopian socialism because it's not on the agenda uh, except as we may get into a little bit later in the presentation uh, some ways in which utopian socialism shows up in uh, some thinking in the socialist movement. But uh, what I would like to do is to wrap up this section of the presentation uh, with those thoughts and then uh, in, uh, in the earlier uh, session that we had where the recording was lost we had a number of questions that were raised and so I'm going to uh, try to answer some, some of those questions. I'll try to read them back as best as I can to, to create a context for my uh, responses. And after we finish with the questions that came in at the beginning of the first session, um, I'm going to go into uh, a little more of a presentation about modern controversies around uh, the meaning of socialism, particularly between uh, different views of socialism and, uh, and communism. Among the uh, among the the questions that we received in the earlier session, uh, one was: Does a lack of competition uh, lead to starvation, which I guess means uh, low production uh, and an inability to provide the supplies that are needed, the commodities that are needed in order to feed the people? And the example that's cited is North Korea. Um, I think that this question uh, really stems from uh, too literally taking what people uh, see on the bourgeois media and read in the press. Uh, in the first place, uh, competition has very little to do with the provision of massive amounts of commodities and, and goods and services for people. Uh, Capitalism, whether it's competitive or in its modern form, being non-competitive, being very largely monopolized, uh, is fabulously productive. The, the problem is the distribution of what is produced. Uh, the citation and the, and the contrast with, that's made with North Korea is really an apples and oranges kind of comparison. North Korea has been under siege and literally at war uh, with the United States and, and other Western powers uh, for most, almost all of our lifetimes uh, since the early 1950s. And uh, during that time, it has been embargoed, it has been uh, isolated. And this is not to minimize uh, the shortcomings and problems of the North Korean regime, which I think are significant. But uh, to compare them with, uh, with countries that do not experience those handicaps and hardships uh, is simply unreasonable. Uh, the expectation I think that any reasonable person who studies the facts will have is that socialism will continue and in fact expand the productivity that exists under capitalism, but it will eliminate the social inequities and the, uh, the problems with the distribution of what is produced under the, the modern economy. We got a question uh, which was, what can I do as a young person? Uh, to help and to learn more? Well, uh, my first answer is uh, as a young person or if you're an old person, one thing you can do if you haven't done so already is to join the Communist Party uh, and to work together with like-minded people to help make progressive changes in society. In terms of learning more, uh, there is a lot of material to read and to study. Uh, the classics of Marxism and of Leninism are available online and as well as from uh, 
at libraries and from various publishers. International publishers, which published this book that we're talking about today, uh, also has a, uh, a list of many other very useful books which are in print, and you can uh, acquire them online uh, or at a bookstore. Um, if you can find a bookstore, <laughs> it's still open these days. Um, the uh, I, I think the the key thing about learning, uh, finding ways to help to make social change is to find other people to work together with, and that's why it becomes so important. Uh, to join our party and also to work in other progressive organizations and people's organizations in unions and community groups uh, in peace organizations uh, church groups if that's your inclination so that uh, we can work together to help solve the pro problems of society uh, another questioner um, mentioned that he had read that Robert Owen uh, the utopian socialist and Thomas Jefferson uh, had met and they were on speaking terms and uh, I wanted to know if that was true. Um, uh, my understanding is that yes Robert Owen who uh, immigrated to the United States at least for a period of time established a utopian socialist colony in Indiana was also quite a celebrity in his day because before he became openly against uh, capitalist uh, profiteering and wealth, uh, he was viewed as a visionary by not only workers but by many capitalists as well. Uh, my check on Google indicates that he actually met with uh, three uh, US presidents or former presidents and uh, Owen also left family in the United States. One of his sons became a state representative and later a Congress member from Indiana. Um, and, uh, had a, and his family had a significant influence on uh, American politics and culture. There was a question about working with the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, which is a, a small um, group, uh, not explicitly socialist as much as uh, I think what we call anarcho-syndicalist. That is, uh, they believe that workplaces should be owned and run by the people that work at them. And the question is whether we should work with groups like that. And my answer would be, uh, yes, when we can find other progressive-minded people to work with, as long as we can find common cause and we can find uh, things that we can work with them jointly, then we should do that. Uh, not to work with such people would be what we call sectarian. Uh, we don't think that we have all the answers uh, or that we're going to solve the world's pro problems all by ourselves. Uh, we have to work with other people. But I would also say that groups like the IWW are uh, in some ways sectarian themselves. Uh, I think for the most part uh, our time would also be profitably spent looking for broader uh, groups of people to influence so that we can reach not tens or dozens of people but uh, thousands and millions of people uh, because that's how social change is going to happen. Um, there was a question as to how we can help people imagine another world. Uh, the uh, the idea and the thought of King's vision, Dr. Martin Luther King's vision, uh, was cited as somebody who, through his uh, vision, through his rhetoric, through his ideas, and especially through his organizing of masses of people, was able to make real change in our society. And uh, I think in some ways the question answers itself. Uh, Martin Luther King is, a, I think, a wonderful example of uh, how you work for social change, um, not merely by spouting rhetoric, but by uh, expressing ideas in ways that people can understand that respond to their actual needs and ways that, uh, that, that will bring forward activity from other people, not uh, change in society, 
of course, is influenced by great leaders such as Martin Luther King, but it also, uh, and more importantly perhaps, comes from masses of people who are tired of living in the old way and, and decide that they have to change. Uh, in this connection, uh, it's worth mentioning that Martin Luther King, uh, part of his legacy that is uh, usually forgotten or deliberately ignored, is his rejection of anti-communism. Uh, King was not a communist himself, but he recognized the important, uh, very significant contributions to the struggle for the liberation of African American people and all people that had been made by communists in the United States. And in fact, uh, in speaking and writing on the occasion of uh, the death of W.E.B. Du Bois, the great uh, African-American historian, uh, the organizer of the NAACP, uh, and uh, a person about who many other things can, uh, can be said, uh, King reminded his listeners that late in his life, Du Bois had joined the Communist Party for the specific purpose of associating his life and the things that he had done and accomplished in his life with his understanding of Marxism and with the Communist Party that he had had close relationships with for most of his adult life. And uh, King chided people who would like to forget that and who would like to pretend that uh, in fact Du Bois could have been Du Bois had he not been a communist. Um, I, th I think King's view of this was made very clear, but it's, uh, it, it's I think, a real shame that people do not choose to recognize this part of King's legacy. Um, with that, I'm going to take a short break for a moment or two, and then we're going to come back in a couple of minutes with uh, part two of the presentation. We will now begin part two. In the earlier segment, we talked about the uh, historical context of Engels' book, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. And what I'd like to do in the second section of tonight's presentation is to bring it up to date, bring it into today's world, and talk about some current views of what socialism is. Uh, I think I have to start with talking about the person who is the most famous contemporary socialist in the United States today, which is Bernie Sanders. Uh, Bernie Sanders' uh, idea of socialism uh, is not really one that many of us would uh, recognize or acknowledge as real socialism, and yet Sanders has performed a historical service in rehabilitating the very word socialism into the American political dialogue. As a result of uh, decades of anti-communism, of uh, hostility towards uh, freedom of speech and open discussion and dialogue uh, brought about uh, through decades of uh, Cold War and, uh, and putting anti-communism and anti-socialism at the very center of American political rhetoric. The very word socialism has been rendered off limits, uh, something that a person can't say or can't acknowledge uh, that they're interested in, much less believing in. And what Sanders has done, uh, very courageously I think, but also very brilliantly, is to reintroduce the word socialism back into the political context, into the political jargon of the United States in a way that thousands and millions of people have embraced to the very point now where among some demographic groups, certain age groups, more people say that they believe in socialism than believe in capitalism. That's quite a remarkable achievement. And while no change like that is purely the uh, work of a single person. I think Bernie Sanders certainly 
deserves as much credit, more credit than anybody else that I can think of for having brought that about. All that being said, uh, I think uh, there is real danger of accepting uh, Bernie Sanders' view of socialism as being the only one or the uh, predominant one or even one that uh, does justice to the history of the socialist movement. I think, properly speaking, uh, Bernie Sanders is uh, someone who believes in making capitalism more livable for the people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, capitalism is a horrible system, uh, one which is uh, very brutal to all sorts of people, uh, workers, uh, people of color, uh, other sections of the population. In fact, the great majority of the population are victimized by capitalism. But Sanders' approach to correcting these problems is to make reforms that make it more livable, not to fundamentally change things. Uh, I want to quote a few things and uh, just to, to make clear what we're talking about here. Um, back in 1986, uh, Sanders said, all that socialism means to me, to be frank with you, is democracy with a small d. I believe in democracy, and by democracy I mean that to as great an extent as possible, human beings have the right to control their lives. Uh, he does say that you can't separate that, the political structure, from the economic structure. Um, and he says you have to believe in economic democracy as well. But by economic democracy, he does not mean the elimination of capitalism or the elimination of exploitation. Uh, he means a more fair distribution of the products of this society. Uh, and real explicitly, to go back to his own words, in 1990, he said, to me, socialism doesn't mean state ownership of everything by any means. It means creating a nation and a world in which all human beings have a decent standard of living. That is, people can live decently, but not necessarily an equitable distribution of what they produce. Um, he cites approvingly uh, the experience of countries in Scandinavia. Uh, he said in Finland and Sweden they have national health care, free college, affordable housing, and a higher standard of living. Why shouldn't that appeal to our disappearing middle class? Um, he said that uh, in these countries, all people have health care as a right of citizenship. College education is available to all people, regardless of income, virtually free. Um, this is the Bernie Sanders view of socialism. And I think if uh, his vision were adopted, it would move this country quite a ways down the road of uh, more decency in our society fairness to people, but it wouldn't solve the problems of capitalism. It wouldn't eliminate the fundamental uh, inequity of capitalism, which is that working people produce all of the goods and services that are used by society, but are robbed of the greater part of their value uh, in the form of uh, the uh, profit-making corporations, uh, what Marx called exploitation. That is, the creation of value by the workers that's in excess of what they receive to uh, feed their families and house their families and to meet all of their own needs. Um, another uh, view of socialism comes from what I believe is the largest socialist organization in the United States, the Democratic Socialist of America, uh, known as DSA. Um, and I'm going to cite uh, some things that I found in uh, their uh, summary of uh, their political strategy. Their, uh, it's a summary of Democratic Socialists of America's strategy document from June 19 or 2016. 
DSA says, and, DS, and I'll quote here, DSA believes that the fight for democratic socialism is one and the same as the fight for radical democracy, which we understand is the freedom of all people to determine all aspects of their lives to the greatest extent possible. Um, they talk about democratic management of businesses by the workers who comprise them. Uh, they uh, uh, talk about um, the democratic planning outside the market uh, for certain sectors of the economy, uh, important sectors of the economy, but not all sectors of the economy. Um, they, don't, they don't talk in that context about public ownership. Um, not that they're against public ownership, but their view of public ownership is limited. It's limited to certain strategic sections of the economy, not to the necessarily to the majority of the economy. And Perhaps most importantly, in my view, uh, DSA does not reject uh, outright the very na nation, excuse me, the very notion and existence of exploitation, um, which is central to the continuation of the capitalist system. Uh, I think what this arises from is a failure to put the working class at the center of their uh, political strategy, rather to view the working class as one of the forces which is to be recruited into the struggle for socialism, and not the leading force, uh, not the main force, but simply one of many. Um, and this in one way is expressed, uh, I'll quote here, U.S. history has shown that the best recruits for socialism are experienced and radicalized workers, and similarly that the best workplace organizers are socialists. Um, rather than seeing the working class as the main force for change, uh, it's a source of recruits for the socialist movement, which presumably is led and guided by people uh, in addition to or perhaps other than the workers themselves. And I would contrast this with the uh, position and the view that is taken by the Communist Party of the United States as expressed in the uh, program of the party that was adopted in 2006 and uh, continues in existence with some minor modifications since then. It's available online. Uh, you can get it through the Communist Party's website. And that program starts out with a rejection of, uh, of capitalism, not starting out with talk about reform of capitalism, but rather, uh, and I'll quote here, we the workers and our allies need to take power from the hands of the wealthy few, their corporations and their political operatives. We need real solutions to real problems, not the empty promises of, comp of politicians and corporate bosses. We need peace, justice, and equality. We need socialism. Uh, from that, the program goes right in to an analysis of the nature of exploitation and a condemnation of that exploitation. Uh, the uh, people who want to understand better what needs to happen uh, in order to change our society uh, will find it very useful to study Marx's analysis of exploitation and how it takes place. That's really at the, at, at the very core of the Marxist view of economics. And uh, here again, a good starting place, in fact, is the brief description of that viewpoint in Engels' book, uh, Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. But there are many other uh, sources, some books written by Marx and Engels themselves, and other books that explain it. Um, going back to the Communist Party's program, uh, the Communist Party uh, sees the working class as the leader uh, and the only force capable of becoming the general leader. 
of the struggle for social progress and for socialism. Uh, the reason for that is that capitalism itself is dependent upon the working class to create the wealth that gives it, and that gives the working class a strategic role in the production process and great potential power. Um, further, because of the struggle between workers and the bosses, the owners uh, who take away so much of what the workers produce, uh, there is an inherent link between that class struggle and the democratic struggles uh, that in many cases arise out of it. But the Communist Party also recognizes that the class struggle, the, uh, the economic struggle, is not identical to the democratic struggle. Uh, the aim of the class struggle is, in the longer term, the winning of power in order to construct socialism. The aim of the democratic struggle is to widen the democratic space for all working people as much as possible as long as capitalism exists. And uh, I think that other groups, uh, some other socialist groups, such as uh, DSA, uh, muddle these distinctions. And I think that it's worth studying the Communist Party's program in order to really see the clear both distinction but also interrelationship of these two concepts. Um, the Communist Party also calls for planning of society. That is uh, especially uh, involving the uh, public ownership, the takeover of public ownership of what are called the commanding heights of the economy, the major industrial firms, the transnational corporations, the banks, and other financial institutions, the energy industry, uh, much of the national distribution system and the healthcare system, uh, and to run them as public utilities. Um, uh, this involves uh, planning of the economy, not allowing the anarchy that's inherent in capitalism to continue. And finally, I want to take note of the distinction that is made uh, and between private property that is owned and operated for profit and personal private property. Uh, which is for the use of uh, people and their families, uh, including workers. Uh, capitalist rhetoric uh, muddies over the distinction. In fact, they don't even recognize the distinction between property that is owned for the purpose of uh, exploiting others, that is profit-making property, and property that is used for the continuation and enhancement of human life, that is, private personal property. I think uh, I've, I've just gone through very quickly some distinctions between different viewpoints, uh, different approaches to socialism. And in doing that, I do not mean to uh, to condemn or belittle uh, any viewpoints that uh, I may have mentioned. Uh, some of them, I think, are erroneous. Um, some are better than others. But I think what we're faced with today in today's world, in, in our country today, uh, is the need to unify all the progressive forces and especially all people who want to work towards a better world, towards a world without exploitation without racism, without uh, sex discrimination. Uh, we have to find ways of unifying uh, all of these forces in order to uh, protect and advance the interests of the people as a whole. I'm going to uh, go back to trying to answer some of the questions that came in, uh, again, during the uh, earlier session where we had some problems making the recording. Um, and I'll try to uh, repeat as best as my notes show what the questions were and, uh, and then try to respond to them uh, in some way. Um, 
uh, when I talked about the uh, the civil rights movement being an extension of uh, the civil rights war and being uh, essentially a revolutionary type of movement. The question came up, how does the CIO, that is the Congress of Industrial Organizations or the Union Federation that was built during the great upsurges of the 1930s and 40s, uh, how does that fit into revolution? Is this uh, the same kind of revolution I was talking about with the civil rights movement? And my response to that is uh, with, without belittling or minimizing the tremendous importance of the uh, building, not only of the CIO, but the expansion of other sections of the labor movement as well. Uh, this, this was not a revolutionary struggle. Uh, this was a struggle for, uh, for reforms and had significant uh, political implications and uh, in a lot of respects changed the politics of our country. But I think it was very much taking place in the context of making reforms to capitalism to make it more liberal, livable rather than making any kind of revolutionary change in it. Uh, the question came as to how do we work towards uh, socialism and achieve the completion of the bourgeois revolution, uh, do democratic victories actually strengthen capitalism? That is, when we win things, when the people win things for themselves, does it uh, lessen their militancy and make them less interested in radical change in society? Uh, that's an old question, and it's one that doesn't have simple answers. But Maybe the best response to it is, what's our choice? Uh, do you fail to try to make life more livable for people because you're afraid they'll become less revolutionary as a result of that? Uh, that, that kind of attitude is, in my view, it's the height of cynicism. Uh, the fact is that people actually become more militant when they learn that they can win victories through struggle. Uh, they are not bought off by... Uh, by achieving victories. In fact, it just whets their appetite for more of them. Um, I think the danger is that we allow people to be told that they can solve their problems under capitalism simply by making reforms uh, rather than changing the whole system itself. We have to make democratic changes in society in order to open the room for making more profound revolutionary changes in society. Uh, so, in my view, there really isn't a contradiction between the two things, as long as they're understood appropriately. We had a comment from somebody, not really a uh, question, I think, that we need people to do more writing to examine the state of the left in the United States. And to that I'll say amen, we do. Uh, but we need writing and study of a lot of things. And uh, this is one of them. Uh, so uh, I certainly would welcome work that anyone wants to do in this regard. We had a question uh, from a young comrade uh, in the South, in, uh, in Georgia, I believe, about what can be done in the South. Uh, he talks about uh, areas like where he lives where uh, progressive people are extremely isolated. Uh, it's very hard to mount any kind of struggle in his view. And he raised the question about uh, alternatives to trade unions. Um, worker centers are being set up as alternatives to unions in certain places. And what I would say to that is, uh, yes, there's a lot of experimentation going on. Part of the reason for it is that the National Labor Relations Act, which really legalized unions in the United States in the mid-1930s, has been successively degraded and undermined and uh, uh, made less useful by, first of all, by legislative changes such as the Taft-Hartley Act, 
but also by an endless series of anti-labor decisions by courts which are notoriously hostile to unions and to workers and by the National Labor Relations Board itself as well as a whole succession of presidents uh, that we have experienced and what needs to be done I think is we need in the immediate uh, term to find ways to make uh, the National Labor Relations Act work uh, to enable the uh, organization of unions. Uh, we may also find alternatives to unions under the NLRB, under the NLRA, and uh, and worker centers are one of those alternatives that has been advanced. Uh, I'm not sure how much success there has been with those, but I think any experiments like these are certainly worthy and, and worth trying. Um, but ultimately, we're going to be in a situation where we're going to be chasing our tails uh, as long as we have capitalism. Uh, at the same time as workers find ways that they can struggle, the capitalists find ways to checkmate that struggle. And uh, ultimately, the change that has to happen is the abolition of capitalism itself. Um, which raised another question. Uh, in the transition to, uh, uh, to capitalism, uh, or transition from capitalism, um, are we fooling ourselves by believing that uh, the working class can merely take state power and state ownership uh, and that we're not going to end up with something that is uh, what, uh, what some uh, so-called socialist thinkers refer to as state capitalism, uh, in which uh, the workers are not really in charge, but rather uh, only have formal control. The, uh, the alternative that is posed by some people, such as uh, Richard Wolff as one so-called Marxist who is quite prominent at the present time, is the idea of uh, worker-owned cooperatives. And I think there are a lot of problems with this. Uh, the, uh, mainly that they are something that uh, does not reflect the actual organization of most important economic units in our society today. Uh, it's hard to imagine, I think, how you would have a workers' co-op that would uh, make iPhones, for example. iPhones are, uh, are sourced uh, throughout the world. They involve thousands, possibly millions of workers. Um, figuring out the mechanism by which you would have a worker co-op uh, is mind-boggling, and I think it's, it's kind of obviously uh, impossible. Uh, what is needed, though, is some not only creative thinking, but experimentation and uh, experience in how we are going to organize a new socialist society and to put together schemes like this before we have any real experience in making these things work is, I think it's a modern day form of utopianism. Uh, the, uh, the forms that society will take and that the economy will take under socialism are going to emerge and they're going to be worked out in the course of struggle, struggle for democracy, for economic and political democracy, and ultimately uh, struggle for public ownership of uh, all of the uh, pieces of our very complex uh, economic society. Anyway, with that, I'm going to wrap up the presentation for tonight. Uh, I thank you for listening and, uh, and all of those people who participated by submitting questions and comments. I think that that helps to enrich the presentation. And finally, I urge everyone, uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, take a look at this little book. Uh, it doesn't take too long to read. Um, it's uh, actually, it's 150 years old now, so it's not uh, a, or, or it's, uh, it, it's not completely modern in terms of where it came from, but it's surprisingly readable and relevant at the present time. 
um, one of the tenets of Marxism. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen it written anywhere, but uh, it's something that I was always told, is uh, that a test of how useful something is is how it holds up over time. Uh, anyone can write a theory that seems appropriate for the present day and for the next year, the next two years, for uh, current conditions. When something is written that has relevance uh, 50 years later, 100 years later, in this case 150 years later, uh, that's uh, a remarkable testament to the essential validity of the underlying thinking that went into it. And uh, so I urge people to take a look, uh, do some studying, and I hope to have a chance to talk with some of you in the future. Good night.